Man, isn't God been good? Look, they said we wouldn't make it, and we made it. They said we couldn't build a church, and we built it. I'm just telling you, God is up to something in Brownfield, and I am excited about it. And I want to tell you the best is yet to come. Amen? Amen. You got to believe that from your spirit, because if you don't, you can only receive what you believe. And so it's a courage. I'm very thankful for our pastors, Pastor Javi and Pastor Brittany. They do a wonderful job at this campus. Can we give our pastors a big hand? Sydney does a great job back in Kids City. We're so thankful for everything. And all the guests and uh, or all the volunteers, thank you so much for everything you do to make TWC successful. We can't do it without you. Sometimes everybody thinks it's one man uh, behind a pulpit. It is so much more than one man behind a pulpit. It's hundreds of people coming together to make this thing work. Yeah. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. If you have not get involved, thank you, sir. If you've not gotten involved, but you are messing, missing the best part of TWC, and that's just to be a part of what the Lord is doing. If your only connection to TWC is on Sunday morning, you are missing the best parts of TWC. There's freedom class, there's growth track, there's community groups that are cranking up. And if you're not plugged in the community, we're not doing community groups, so you have one more thing to do. We're doing community groups, so you don't have one more thing to do. They'll keep you accountable. Come on, somebody. They'll keep you where you need to be. So real quickly, can we welcome our first time guest and our South Campus this morning? Amen. It is crazy. If you try to go to our West Campus right now, God bless you trying to get in there. They got Upland shut down. And I don't know if there's anybody saved going to West Campus right now. They, they have lost the joy by the time they've got in the parking lot. I, I did not know you could tell so much sign language going up in the parking lot these days. And so it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Trish is already on the front row going, oh, my God. This is, I mean, this is the best I got, girl. So we're in a series called Baggage, and we're on a journey called Life. And the truth is, somewhere along the way, we start picking up things that aren't supposed to be a part of the trip. And either you fight your whole life to get rid of it, or what most of us do is we just learn to compensate and think this is the best we can ever hope for. But because of this, many people don't enjoy the journey at all. And it's not because the destination is wrong. How many know heaven's going to be great? It's going to be amazing. You know what? Can I tell you something? The worship has changed in this church perch since I've been. The first time I came in here and preached, it was like this. <laughs> and so the culture is catching on. I see some of you, some of you, you already done. You, you, you've gone from just doing this, like Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> Seen some of you with your hands like this. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Huh? Some of you like this. Few of you have gone full-blown charismatic. I seen you. I seen you. I love it. Uh, but we got those ones that grew up in Baptist church. They just like this. <laughs> You're going to come. You're going to get there. You're going to get there. There's hope for you. Listen, uh, I think most of us learn rather than to overcome, we learn to compensate. And God didn't create you to compensate. He made you to overcome. Amen. Amen. Baggage primarily comes from one or two places. First place is some kind of mistake or some kind of shame, some kind of issue uh, with your past. And the past can be a real problem with guilt and shame and all that gets attached to us. We talked a lot about that in week number two. If you missed that, you can catch that on our our YouTube page and go back and uh, listen to it. Uh, Week before last, we talked about the majority of the baggage that people face is people. We got relational wounds, people we trusted, people that we thought that were uh, part of the uh, Toretto family. They were our ride or dies. Come on, somebody. If you're not watching Fast and the Furious, are you even trying to go to heaven? I'm just saying right there. Uh, for the family. Anyway, he's, they, when you could take a Pontiac Fiero to the moon, you have accomplished some things in your life. And so uh, great things are happening there. But, but people say things. 
and people do things and they hurt us and and we try to act like it was no big deal but those words and those experiences whatever it was they attached themselves to us and we discussed that last week in relational wounds in fact at west uh, i don't know about here uh, but over there was one of the largest altar calls we've ever given for people to come forward with relational wounds and and i want to tell you something there is nothing wrong with an answer in an altar call at church if if you need prayer the best place to get prayers at church come on somebody he said well somebody might see me well somebody gonna see you uh, you know if when you're doing shady let them catch you when you're doing it right amen we prayed for marriages the other day and people like I, I don't want nobody to know we got marriage problem they're gonna know when they read it in the paper so let's get it nipped in the bud and let's fix this thing if you need prayer for anything we don't want to take courage out of you we want to put courage on the inside of you in week one, we established that all of that that attaches to itself is because of a biblical word uh, for baggage, which is called a stronghold. And it's attached itself to you. And that Greek word literally means that you're a prisoner locked up by a lie. You believe it, but it doesn't really exist because you haven't taken. But if you would take that thing captive, like the scripture says, you could overcome that thing. So the baggage you're carrying was not even true. It was a deception that the enemy convinced you was a part of you. And it's really not supposed to be a part of you. Sometimes I wish people would just hit me rather than say things. Because if you hit me, at least the bruise will go away here in a couple of days. But there's some of us here this morning that have gotten words that were spoke over us when we were five or six. And now we're 40 and 50 years old and we're still carrying the weight of that damage. It's a saying to me, the power, the, the Bible says it though, right? There is power of life and death in your tongue. Every time, watch me, you open your mouth, you're either putting courage in or you're taking courage out. And you decide what's going to come out of your mouth. And surely, if you know how bad it messed you up, why would you want to mess somebody else up? Today, we're going to talk about the bag that won't let go. Many people, when they get saved, they get a high percentage of, of baggage just falls off of us. It, it just, for whatever reason, we're able to, to get out of it. But, but, but there's a ton of us that we got one area that we still struggle with. It's, it, it's called a, a besetting sin. It's, it's, it's one that just kind of sneaks up on us all the time and, and gets us when we least expect it. And, and I don't know what yours is, but mine is anger. I, I'm going to go out there, well, pastor shouldn't be angry. There's a lot of things you shouldn't be. You, you worry about you, okay? <laughs> Anger is my issue. I have to submit that to the Lord every day so that I don't reach out inside my body and snatch somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the only one. Well, we got some good Christians over here in Brownfield. I, I need some of y'all come to West and help us get saved, but... I have to watch my... When they shut down my street on Upland, I had to watch myself. Oh, I was mad. I got a phone call the other day, and I, they, they called my assistant, and they were real ugly to my assistant on the phone. And I said, give me that phone. I called them right back, and I, and I got as ugly as they were. And then I walked off, and 30 seconds later, the Holy Spirit said, well, that went well, didn't it, Todd? And I said, I didn't ask you for no help. And he said, it's... <laughs> I don't know how y'all talk to the Lord, but I'm just honest. I'm just an east side hood rat. I'm just honest. I said, I didn't ask you for no help. And he said, well, it's obvious. <laughs> you wouldn't have been acting like that. So I had to go walk. Can I tell you the real truth? It was another pastor in my city. Yeah, he was ugly to my people, and I got ugly right back. I said, Let, don't start none. Won't be none, bro. Meet me out in the street. Come <laughs> you bad on the phone. Come see me right now. I, I hate, don't you hate those people on the phone? They real tough, or on Facebook, or <laughs> keyboard warriors. That dude got my blood pressure up, and then I had to walk behind me and say, "Look, man, I was right about everything I said, and I was wrong how everything I said it." And Pastor Shane just looked at me. He goes, "Look at you growing, Pastor Todd. Just, <laughs> just look at you just stretch it out on God's word." And I said, "Look at you being unemployed, Shane. Just look at you." being unemployed and so uh 
and here's the truth. I was in the middle of writing a new series. I got a new series coming out on the Beatitudes, which I haven't taught in about 20 years. And if I hadn't have been writing that message, I would have never made the walk. And so I was like, Lord, this is for them, not for me, you know. And it was kind of one of those things. But anybody know what I'm talking about, man? Life would be great if you didn't have that one thing. Life would be awesome if it wouldn't, if I didn't have a bent towards it, or let me use my SAT word, a proclivity uh, towards it. it. It just won't let go, and, and you haven't been able to get rid of it for whatever reason. We even say things like, well, maybe, maybe God just put that there. Maybe that's just what I'm supposed to have, or, or maybe it's just the way it's always going to be, so we learn to cope with it. But can I tell you, that's not God's best for you. And I believe that God wants to set you free from the bag that won't let go, whether it be addiction, a habit, or a hurt, or a hang up. God wants to set you free this morning, but you can only receive what you believe. But if you want to leave this place better than the way you came, give God a good shout of praise right about now. I'm sure you've come to services just like this one and said, God, never again. I cannot tell you how many times I went to an altar and told the Lord, I'll never do this again, only to find myself. I couldn't even make it eight hours before I was doing it again. And I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about, but man, I would, I meant it when I prayed it, Cody, I meant it. Like this is my last time to struggle with this. The only problem is my spirit was saved and my flesh was still unsubmitted. Nobody told me that when I got saved, my spirit got saved, but my flesh, he's, ooh, Jesus. My flesh has got some issues. And just when I think I've got those issues all nailed to the cross, I found out that one part of my flesh has pulled off the nails. My gosh. And it shows up again and again and again. So I want to see if I could give you some tools to get rid of it once and for all. And so if you got your Bibles, go with me to Romans uh, chapter 7, which was written by Paul. If anybody had baggage, Paul has some baggage, y'all. He's out killing Christians. Come on, somebody. If you're not a murderer, there's hope for you. And if you are a murderer, there's hope for you. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, if you are a murderer, don't raise your hand. People may move, right? <laughs> I had no idea we had got this much of an outreach church. You know? <laughs> Last week I asked people, if you've ever been uh, stabbed, raise your hand. And people was ready. Oh, here we go already. <laughs> Let's ask over here. If you've ever been stabbed, let me see your hand. All right. If you've ever been shot, let me see your hand. Oh, shoot. All right. That, that's who we won't take an up offering. The ones that will take a bullet. We won't. <laughs> Right there. You, you ain't going to, somebody pulls up a bullet wound, you're not going to put a, you're going to put a dollar in. <laughs> My bad, bro. I had no clue. But Paul, where we get most of our theology and doctrine, this is the kind of guy he was in Romans chapter seven. He says this, Dwayne, I didn't know that about you. Dwayne Ruth, both of you, left hand stab, right? You know, he up here, he thought he was playing twister back there with all the questions I was asking. He says, I don't understand myself at all. And I'm so glad for the Bible where it doesn't just say you're an idiot, but it lets you know that other people in the Bible had issues as well. That some of our heroes of faith had some issues of well, and this is one of the greatest men of God of all time. And he says, I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what's right, but I don't. Mm. Instead, I do the very thing that I hate, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The one thing that I really don't want to do, but I find myself doing. But let me give you some things to help you recognize the bag that won't let go and what it looks like. It's a cycle, and I believe perhaps a cycle of destruction starts with this. If you're a note taker, number one, it becomes a part of your identity. <clears throat> Like the lame man laid at the gate called beautiful. It didn't even give his name. It just gives us his condition. Yeah. His identity had been com was more conformed to his issue that his name had been lost. And isn't that a crazy paradox to have a, a lame man laid at a gate called beautiful? It doesn't even make sense. It's almost insensitive. In other words, 
It's not just a problem anymore. You just say, that's who I am. My dad was angry. I'm going to be angry. My grandpa was angry. I'm going to be angry. My dad was a drunk. My grandpa was a drunk. I'm going to struggle with alcohol. My mom was this. My, dad, my grandmama was this. Uh, that's just who I am. Am. And I want you to know that I think that's a very dangerous belief. See, I want to take every lie that the devil has ever told you and expose it to some truth. And the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, he is a brand new creature. And you don't have to be like your daddy. And you don't got to be like your mama. You can be set free in the name of Jesus. But we buy into the lie like, hey man, this is just it. I believe God wants to set you free where you're not known by your condition anymore. I think it leads to the next part of the cycle, which is this. You feel increasingly hopeless. You think there's no hope for you. There's no hope for change. I've read all the books, Todd. I've been to all the AA meetings. I, I, I got the t-shirt from it. Come on, somebody. And it didn't help. Hopelessness shows up when we fought the same thing. Over and over again for years, which leads to the next part of the cycle and the destruction. And that is you become defensive about your issue. I know nobody in here, but your friends at the other church. Come on, somebody. You become defensive. You defend your problem. You defend your mindset. You defend your habit. Or you'll say, I really don't have a problem. Get out of my face. Like, not yo. Get out of my face. Things that just go through my head, pray, pray for me. We say crazy. If I wanted to stop, I could stop. Or you don't know what I've been through. If you've been through what I've been through, maybe you'd be like I am. But, but it's easy for you to judge somewhere that you've never been. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Which leads to the next step and you become a slave to it. It starts telling you how to live your life. And if we're all honest... We might say today that, that we've got this one area of my life that kind of bosses me around. And, and I'm not talking about your spouse. Come on. <laughs> I'm not even looking at mine right now. Shoot. But I'm a slave to it. I don't want to be in debt. But I can't stop shopping. It was such a great deal. Can I tell you, it's only a good deal when you can afford the deal. It amazes me. People say, I bought this, and, and then you're mad at God because you can't afford to pay it six months later. You didn't even ask him, should you buy it in the first place? Now you want him to help pay for it. Oh, it's getting quiet in this little church now. we mad at God. You know you didn't have the money. Well, they told me 0% interest for, for 60 months. I was like, bet. And 32 months into it, you don't even know how you're going to finish paying for it. And you're indifferent with the Lord. You quit tithing. You quit giving. How do you expect your finances to get better if you're robbing from God? Listen, you're not robbing from the worship center where you don't give. You're robbing from yourself and you're robbing from God. Because I want you to think about this. You say, Pastor Todd, you're mean. No, I'm just real honest. Like somebody this morning said, hey, how you doing? I said, uh, um, or how are you? I said, I'm chubby, but I'm not really working on it. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I'm, I'm just real honest. Some of you haven't put a dime in this church, and the church is still going. So we don't need your money, but you need to give it so the Lord can bless your finances. And ha Pastor Harvey's right. You can tithe for 90 days. And if it don't work, we'll give you all your money back. Every bit. No question says. Why would I do that? Because I have a God that doesn't know how to fail. Yeah. I don't make me nervous at all. The first time I said that, the elders were like, ah! hold on, Pastor Todd. Let's pray about this. I said, no, either the Bible works or it doesn't work. Either the Bible's true or it's not true. And he said, well, can we go like with 30 days? Because 90 days is... <laughs> That's, that could be a lot of money. Come on, somebody. And I was like, it doesn't matter because God doesn't know how to fail. Are you tracking with me this morning? But, but, but it's only a good deal. When you, if you have to go into hawk for it, it's not a good deal, which leads me to the last one. You begin to lose your life to that thing. You give up all your hopes and your dreams, even the promises of God's word. 
You say God's word must be for everybody else, but they'll never be a part of my life because, because the truth is on the wall. It's just out there. Just read it for yourself, Todd. And you resign yourself to the fact that you're never going to have that or, 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 or have what they have. And, and you lose your life and you just begin to cope with things. You come to church and you see people worship and you don't understand how they worship. You come to church and, and you see these things and like I'm doing what they're doing. Why isn't it showing up? And you lose hope. And Romans chapter 6 says this. Robert, help me a little bit more with my monitor, please. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body. How many parts? Any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourself completely to God. Sin is no longer your master. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Isn't that a powerful scripture right there? That is awesome. Well, PT, how do I know if I'm really under the whole master thing? It could be something as simple as food. You eat too much. Or why you get through eating. As soon as you get through eating, you stick your finger down your throat. It could be gambling. It could be your language. Bitter water and sweet water shouldn't come out of the same tap. It could be shopping. It could be people you run with. Well, I got to run with her. She, le- she sleeps next to me. but <laughs> I get it. I get it, but there might be a group of people that you need to cut out of your life. There may be some barbecues that you got to turn down. How do you know? Man, look, I've been there. Come on. I had, there's some places I can't go no more. There's some people I can't run with anymore. Or there was a season I couldn't. I waited three years before I went back to any of my friends that used to be addicted to drugs. Three years so that I could see them and know that I could help them come out without me going back in. I didn't think I was better than them. I wasn't judging them. I was judging me. Are you hear what I'm telling you? I couldn't get around them. If they had a pipe lit and I smelt that weed, I was like, oh, it's just a little weed. You know, weed's not addicted. Let me just get up on here. The next thing I know, it's on an eight ball. Why? Because little sin turns into big sin and big sin kills. It could be people you need to get out. It, if you, it may be control. You may be obsessed with control. Here's some questions you can ask yourself to know if you might have an issue this morning. Are you ready? Do you or your family and friends say you, do any of your family or friends say you have a problem? Do you continue to do it even though it's hurting people? Do you arrange your schedule around it? It's amazing to me how much we can arrange our schedule around everything but church. Can you go one week without it? Is it leading you to isolation? Here's the big one. Are you trying to keep it on the DL? Are you trying to keep it a secret? If you answered yes to two or three of those things, there's a chance that you're being mastered by something that you've probably just learned to cope with and say it's just a part of it. It's just a long for the ride, but it's keeping you from God's best. And, 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 and let me give you some hope this morning, okay? They have found out that most men are likely to struggle with all the days that start with T. Tuesday, Thursday, today, and tomorrow. It's just a fact. You say, why'd you throw that in? Because we need a little laugh in here this morning because I see some desperation in this room. And I want you to know you're going to be all right and that you can get better and that God is going to help us today if we'll let him help us. God's word has some wonderful solution for us. What would it take to be free? How do I break free from the one thing that won't let go? Second Corinthians 3 says it like this. Now the Lord 
is the spirit. I want you to know that there is a such thing as the manifest presence of God. And when it's in a room, it will change your life. That word spirit actually comes from the word pneumos, where we get our word pneumonia from, which means breath of life or, or not a ghost, the breath of life. So I don't even see it, but I feel it. Look, I've never seen the wind, but I felt it yesterday. You hear what I'm telling you? And there's a part of God's presence that you may never see, but how many of you have felt his presence? Amen. And so it goes on to say, now the Lord is spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I want you to know that I love being your pastor and I love the worship center, but you can experience both of those things and not have freedom. You could come to the worship center every Sunday and not have freedom. But if we create an environment where you experience God, you will find freedom. And that's what we want for you as a staff. Everything we do on Sunday is to help you encounter God. And the rest of the things we do is to help you continue to chase God for yourself. Come on, that you don't need a pastor and you don't need a priest. You need the presence of God to go with you and for you, behind you and ahead of you. That's what you need in your life. Galatians tells us what Jesus' mission was. Galatians 5.1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. His goal was not to point his accusing finger at you. We've been taught that God wants to hit us with a two by four. If that were true, most of us would be dead by now for how many times he'd had to hit us to get right. That God wants to continue. Listen, Jesus didn't come to make you sorry. He came to make you free. He didn't come to make you feel sorry. He came to make you free. Religion. I'm going to make y'all mad now. Religion will make you feel sorry. And Jesus came on a rescue mission to get you out of that mess that you've been in. That's Jesus' role in the process of getting the bag off of you. His mission of freedom. Well, well, what part do I play? Because he doesn't do it all by himself. You got to cooperate with him. What part do I play? I'm glad you asked. When you guys ask questions, you help me preach better. Thank you so much. So here's the one. First thing you got to do is get rid of all your excuses. You probably have some things that you can legitimately blame some of your behaviors on. Like my dad was mean or it really did hurt. I get it. And I'm not saying it's not real. What I'm saying is that always blaming it on somebody else is never going to help you get out of your mess. Here's the truth. My dad was a deacon and my mom was a youth pastor and I was a drug addict. It wasn't because I didn't come from a good family. It wasn't because I come from a good home. I just, that was in me. And you can blame everything on everybody else, but come on, I'm 54 years old. I can't, my dad's been gone for seven years. I can't go around the rest of my life saying my dad did this, my mama did. You a grown man. You a grown woman. Quit talking about your daddy and start being a good daddy. Quit talking about your mama and start being a good mama. Come on, I'm trying to help you this morning. You can't blame everything on everybody else. At some point, you're going to say, I'm going to break the cycle. I refuse to be like that anymore. And, and, and at some point, you take responsibility for that bag that's on the trip with you. And you say, I'm tired of carrying this around. Now, Jesus is inviting people to get their life changed. And watch what these people do. He says, I can change your life. And in Luke chapter 14, watch what they do. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I got to go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try to uh, try them out. Please excuse me. Still another one said, I just got married, so I can't come. He had to get permission is what he was saying. (laughs) If you really want to experience freedom at some point, you have to say enough is enough. And today it stops with God's help. But Todd, it's too hard. Let me help you. You don't have to do it alone. I'm going to give you the Christian cliche uh, scripture that will help you with all of that. It's just Philippians 4.13 that I can do everything. How many things? Everything. Everything through him who gives me strength. And that's the truth for whatever lie you've been told. Because a bag is a stronghold, which is a prisoner that has been locked up by something that's not true. Here's the second thing. You got to cut the ties. You can't just come here and say, all right, God. 
Here it is, take it, and then leave it here and go right back to the same old stuff you were doing before the prayer and think you're going to experience freedom. That's insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. You got to take inventory of your life and see what people or what influences may be pulling you down. Again, I say this all the time. They're either putting courage in you or taking courage out. And if God is trying to take me on this journey, come here, Pastor Javi. If God is trying to take me on this journey and, and, and I'm trying to pull him up, who's got the best leverage, him or me? He does. It is easier for him to pull me down than it is for me to pull him up. You understand what I'm saying? But it don't always got to be that way. I can get stronger when I can go back with my crew. And I can come in and we can all pull him. You're not hearing what I'm telling you. That we don't do life alone. But until that day comes, I may have to rid myself of some of the people in my life. 1 Corinthians 15 says, do not be misled. Which means some people can be misled. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come, look, this is strong. Come back to your senses. In other words, say, quit being stupid. <laughs> my grandmama, my grandmama gets into me sometimes. That's my grandmama. Quit being stupid. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. In other words, make some good decisions out there outside of the church. It's easy to make good decisions in here. What you doing when you leave here? Nobody cares how much you pray in tongues. Nobody cares how many altar calls you have if you can't walk it out when you live here. Some of you need to break off some relationships that you're in that's no good for you. Take some people out of your phone because you know as long as that influence is there, it's going to pull you down. Some of us need filters on our phone and on our internet. And it just keeps, that way we don't fall back into things. It just keeps happening. But I'm going to take a step to make sure it never happens. Listen, one of my spiritual sons came to me years ago and said, Pastor Todd, I'm struggling with pornography and I need some help. What do I need to do? I, I said, man, there's a filter that you can get on your computer and your phone and every time you try to be shady it'll send somebody an email to let them know you're looking at something you shouldn't be looking at and he's like oh I don't know if I want to do that I said oh, so you, you just want to continue to he's married and I said so you just want to continue to have an affair on your wife and he said well I'm not sleeping with anybody else I said but you're fantasizing about somebody else Oh, I need some real. Look, you at the wrong church if you want me to water the message down. I ain't got time. Jesus is coming back and people are going to hell. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. I got to preach this thing like I feel it. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? So he put it on his phone and sure enough, man, I was getting emails all day long. I was like, dead gum, you. Either you got strong forearms or you're strong wore out. Church is on the front row going. People are like, I came for one year anniversary. I didn't know he was going to be like that. I'm on my best behavior. My mama's all, <laughs> my mom's in rehab right now, not for drugs. She had, she had foot surgery. Let me, think, let me let everybody think my mama's in rehab for drugs. I guarantee you she's watching online right now going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When I see that boy... Listen, he said, will you help me? I said, absolutely. Why? Because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So if he's seeking, it means some of us can get sifted. But I also like that other part where it says he goes around like a roaring lion because he can't be one, so he has to pretend. You realize Satan's still playing dress up? How he been around since, or how long he been? He's old enough to be out of costumes by now. So sometimes you got to beat the enemy to the punch because he's just not going to stop trying to ruin your life. James says in this, chapter 4, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil. Watch me. Submit, then resist, and he'll flee. It's hard to sit somebody on the run when you're running with them. Make the decisions today to get rid of the excuses, cut the ties, and I'm willing to bet you already know what those things are. And, and, and here's the last one. Anytime you take something out of our life, there's going to be emptiness there. 
It just happens. We associate it with what, that's why dieting is so hard. If you, how many of you went on a diet on Friday and by Monday you already done broke that thing? That's why Weight Watchers got all that money right there. People, they got that plan, they buying them meals and them meals go first, <laughs> they get freezer burnt, don't they? <laughs> I am first thing on Monday, I am going on a diet. This is my week to get set free, I am on a diet. Then you're like, well, Wednesday, somebody's got a birthday. And I got to go to their birthday. I've been going to, they're 107 years old. They won't even know if you're there. <laughs> and you're like, but I got to go because they're going to have cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you got to feel that area of emptiness or something else to get back in there and you'll go right back to it. So the third thing is I got to fill the void. I got to put something meaningful in the place or so I don't go back to it. Ephesians chapter five. Don't get drunk on wine. You can put anything in there. Don't have too much excess on porn. Don't have it on gambling. Don't have it on eating. Don't, are, are, are you tracking with me? Don't get drunk on that thing, which leads to debauchery. That word debauchery, here's what it means. It's an excessive indulgence in your senses. In other words, your senses take over. So if you feel it, you just do it. That's why the, the hippies in the 70s were like, if it just feels good, do it. You just fall back into it. But let me tell you something. If you're not in control, something else is in control. And if it's not the spirit of God, it's the spirit of Satan. You may not want to hear that, but I'm telling you, there are times in my life that I've gotten so angry that I've done things I didn't even remember what I'd done. And my wife would say, I can't believe you did that. And I said, I didn't do that. She said, you absolutely did that. I said, "You're, you're a liar. There's no way I did that. And she would walk me over to the wall where there's a hole in the wall. And the evidence was from me. But I had gotten so mad and black, I call it black outrage and I didn't remember what I did. If you're not remembering what you did and you cause that kind of violence, I promise you, it's not the spirit of the Lord. Are are you tracking with me this morning? So you got to put something in, in, in front of it. It says, so don't be filled with debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Well, Todd, what do I put in? Put in God's word. I made a discipline long ago that I will make God's word a part of my life every day. Every day I read my Bible. Every day. It's, even if it's just for three minutes or two minutes, I read my Bible every day. I don't let my day take me. I take the day before I get started. You understand what I'm saying? And, and, and so I made it a discipline. Hebrew tells us that the word is living and active like a sword that can go down and cut some stuff off of us. I challenge you to do it every day. If it's one verse, did you know if you read your Bible 10 to 15 minutes a day, you could read your whole Bible in a year? 10 to 15 minutes a day, you could finish it in a year. And if you do, watch what the Bible says will happen. Ephesians chapter 5, you get washed by the cleansing of God's word. And I don't know if you know this, when God washes us, He doesn't use a fire hose. He lets it run. He dips his hands and he just lets it sprinkle off of you. Sprinkle off of you. But but if we're not careful, we'll treat everybody else with a fire hose. Better than, different than the way God treats us. And I don't want you to look up here and say, man, Pastor Todd, you got all these clean clothes and all of that. Listen, I got some stains on me too. I got some issues that I'm still working on too. And I am desperate to have God wash those areas off of my life. Second thing I got to do is I got to put in some prayer. I want Christianity, real Christianity, and I don't want to be religious. I want to be in a relationship with Jesus. I don't want my Christianity to come down to a cross that I wear where I'm cussing out of my mouth. Mic test, check one. I want you to know that prayer is not some formal saying between you, God. It's not some ritual. It's just a conversation between you and God. And it doesn't sound, need to sound any different than the way you talk to people. Yeah. Man has turned it into something fancy. Yeah. Can I tell you, God is not from England. Yeah. Oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy... <laughs> and I think Jesus is looking at God saying, like, who is that? Like, I made them. I didn't make them like that. I, what are they doing? Whatever it is, he understands our weaknesses. Listen, 
He understands your issues. He understands your trouble with the porn, with the food, with the anger, whatever it is. He faced them himself, but he didn't cave in. Hebrews 4, Jesus understands our weaknesses for he faced all of the same temptations we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to our gracious God. There we will receive mercy and grace, not punishment, not a two by four. Mercy and grace to help us when we need it. I don't need mercy and grace when everything's going wrong. I need mercy and grace when I failed. And then I got to do this. I've got, I filled it with God's word and prayer. Then I got to get an accountability partner. One that I'll tell the truth to. Accountability is only as good as you make it. Pastor Jimmy had some issues here a while back and he was asking me, where did I fail? I, I can't believe this happened and this happened. I said, hold on. You can't carry that weight. I preach every Sunday and every Sunday I give an altar call and people walk out without changing their lives. That's not my fault. I can't carry the weight of you walking out. I refuse to carry the weight of that walking out. Pastor Jimmy said, I failed somewhere. I said, Jimmy, you didn't fail. You did not fail. They failed by coming and saying, hey, I got a struggle. Listen, we don't mind you having a stumble, but let's catch it before it becomes a struggle. Huh? Let's catch it. I don't mind you having an impure thought. Pastor Todd, I, I saw this woman today and, and man, this thing thought in my head. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about it. Here's where I mind it, Pastor Todd. I met up with this woman at a hotel and I cheated on my family. Okay, you don't meet up a hotel at the first time. There was a progression there. It started with a thought, then you watered the seed. Come on. Then you spent 10. I can help you with just a seed. I can't help you after you spilt it. Y'all going to catch that on the way home. Proverbs 28 says this. You need to, somebody needs to know when you're lonely and somebody needs to know when you're about to explode. You hear me? Proverbs 28. Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. You need somebody to hold you accountable, somebody to check on you. And that's why community groups are such a big thing at the worship center. And these groups aren't so we can have one more ministry, one more program. They're there so we can help save your life, help save your marriage, help save your kids. Come on. And some of you need to start hosting one. Well, I don't know what to do. Get a bag of Doritos. People will come. Bag of Dor- if you got Mexican food, I'll come right now. Right, I'll drive from Lubbock to Brownfield for Mexican food community group. But not like microwave Mexican food, like real huh? Like rolling them tortillas out on your thigh kind of Mexican food. Uh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you. My God, that's the kind I like right there. Listen, you create an environment, lives will begin to change. Life change always takes place in the context of relationships. How many times, Brandon uh, Morales, he, he, he's the king cooker. He always cooking. I said, what do you do when you're not cooking? He says, cooking. Yeah. And what are you doing when you're not doing that, thinking about cooking? <laughs> like he don't, he don't struggle with porn, food, cooking. Barbecue is his porn, <laughs> right? That is what he, Morales is all out of that. Well, I'm going to cook tomorrow. How you he's thinking a week ahead of what he's going to cook on Friday and Saturday for all the people. That's his love language. That's his love language. And there have been time in the community groups that nobody opened a Bible, but somebody opened their heart around a barbecue pit. We just started talking things we would have never talked about if we hadn't been in that context. Community group don't have to be somebody opens a Bible. It just has to be somebody opens their heart. Are you tracking with me? They got a community group coming up at West Campus like Frisbee golf. That's going to be nothing but white people. Nothing but white people at Frisbee golf. <laughs> they asked me, Pastor Todd, will you come to Frisbee golf? I said, bro, I'm too black for Frisbee golf. I, am. <laughs> You're not get, I ain't getting God. I'm embarrassed to be seen out there. If I'm at McKenzie Park, I'm out there for a reason. <laughs> I'm going to let one of my friends I graduated from Dunball catch me out there doing. <laughs> not happening. I ain't getting God. Watch, watch. We're going to take a picture of that community group and they're all going to be like. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, that's funny right there. I don't care who you are. Because I think Pastor Evan, the guitarist, is leading that community group. <laughs> Let me get back to this. After you get ability, you got to get in the ministry. What am I going to do? I'm going to do something that makes a difference in this world. Listen, you know how many people I turned on to drugs? Thousands. And I have spent the last 28 years of my life trying to turn people onto the cross. You have got to get in ministry. Romans says, do not be overcome by evil. Don't be overcome by that thing, that bag, but overcome evil with good. Ministry, serving, run a camera, help with sound, play an instrument, sing a song, pass a bucket, serve a coffee, huh? park a car. Sit some folks. Hang out with the young people on Wednesday nights. Jump up and down with some kids in the back. We'll give you some duct tape to go back there, whatever you need. <laughs> Listen, you can't do any of these things apart from relationship with God. And I would love for you to be a part of the worship center for sure, but I am more interested in you being a part of the family of God than anything. Amen. And getting back to God's original design. So here's what's on the table this morning. Let's drop off some baggage. It will be the easiest thing you've ever done in your life, but it's going to cost you everything. And I'm asking you to give up all the misery that has led up to this point and let the Lord take you in the direction that he wants to take you. Some of you, have been asking the Lord long enough to take this away and you're still, last Sunday you asked him to take away and you already stumbled this week. Let's get rid of the bag that won't let go. And I don't want anybody to be ashamed and I don't want anybody to have guilt. I have people tell me all the time, Todd, you share too much of your testimony. You shouldn't be that raw. You shouldn't be that honest. I don't got time to worry what people think about me. People are going to hell. And if you, look, if you worry, bit worried about me, you, your life is really boring. You are really lonely. You ain't got to say, come on. <laughs> My life might be fantastic. <laughs> Pastor Brittany say, he real bad. He... Get your woman, man. <laughs> How is it? But we got to get some stuff out, man. We've been faking it long enough, right? We use that term, fake it till you make it. And it hadn't helped. So let's get some help. Let's get rid of it. Yeah. And I know what's, what's different about Brownfield and Lubbock is in a smaller community, people are less likely to come to the altars because in small town, most of the time, everybody knows your business. Yeah. Well, let's give them something to talk about. Let's give them something to talk about and let's watch real life change begin to happen. So I want everyone to bow their head at every campus. And I just want you to be honest this morning. Whether you come and let us pray for you or not, I just want you to be honest this morning with where you're at. You're here this morning, you say, Pastor Todd, man, I, I love God. He loves me. I know he loves, but I got this one area of my life that I can't seem to break up. One area that I just constantly struggle with. If that's you, can I just see your hand this morning? Yeah. Don't be embarrassed. Yeah, I got you. My hand's up. Your pastor hand is up. Anybody else? Once you raise it, you can put it down. Yep, yep. Pastor Todd, I got this addiction. Let me go a little further. I got this addiction that I, it's got me and I, I don't know how to get out. If that's you, can I see your hand? Okay, yep, yep. How many of you would be honest and say, I've got unforgiveness in my heart and I need to let that go? Yeah, that's a big one. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn this back over to our other campuses. And our worship team is going to play a song and sing a song. And as they sing this song, if you need prayer for any one of those things or something else, maybe we didn't even mention it, I want you to come this morning and I, wanna, I want you to let us put courage on the inside. And let's take discouragement out. Amen? Amen? So let's move real quickly. Don't wait on anybody else. This is you and your relationship.